Okay, uh, I have only 181 slides, so you will probably get to work on time. Uh, but all the slides are already posted. They are at bit.ly slash SNY, like Simpty New York, hyphen 2, like February, hyphen 20, like this year. And that will be on the last slide, too. So if you can't make out the words in the back of the room, don't worry about it. I'm going to start with um, some comments that came up at the January meeting, nice, well-attended meeting. Uh, thanks to Mark for the picture. Uh, one comment was, maybe we'll get 3D TV when we get 5G. And the other one is, if you don't have more bits, you can't do HDR. So I'm going to start with those. Uh, why hasn't 3D TV, by which I mean stereoscopic 3D, taken off? And Pete offered some uh, stuff in his presentation about auto stereoscopic displays. There are lots of possible engineering issues. But there's a perceptual issue, which is um, accommodation virgins conflict that's outside of Percival's zone of comfort. So let me explain that. Accommodation is what we focus on. And in 3D, you're always focused on the screen regardless of what your eyes are pointing at, which may be in front of the screen, at the screen, or behind the screen. And this is something that you have done together, accommodation and convergence, since you were a little baby. And so it's one of the strongest connections you have in your mind. Um, so if you disconnect those, you may get uncomfortable. Now, there's a very wide range of comfort. The darker color here is the range of comfort. Uh, you can see that's going up to 15 meters on the vertical scale and out to 15 meters on the uh, horizontal scale. The lighter color is not necessarily comfortable, but at least you can make a solid 3D picture out of it. Um, so, in cinema, you have something like that green dashed line, where things going out to infinity are perfectly comfortable. It's only something that comes off the screen and bites you on the nose that's going to be uncomfortable. But in TV, if we go to something like the Lechner distance for viewing, which I'll explain in a moment, uh, 2.7 meters, then most of what you're watching is going to be outside the range of comfort. The stuff that Pete just showed you uh, was all relatively close. They didn't have any uh, scenes of nature or something like that, city, whatever. There was a sneaker moving around or a person standing in front of a wall. And this is the typical, uh, oh, isn't 3D wonderful? And look where that is on the scale. You don't even necessarily get to converge that into a single image. So the Lechner distance is what we've always said is the distance that people sit from their TVs. And it's true. Uh, Bernie Lechner, a researcher at RCA Labs, polled everyone who was working at RCA Labs and said, how far do you sit from your TV? And it was roughly nine feet with very little difference. Um, this is the year that we're all supposed to see more clearly, 2020. And 2020 vision is uh, based on this eye chart that you've seen at your ophthalmologist. It's called a Snellen chart because there was a Dutch ophthalmologist who uh, wrote a book in 1862 um, and that's what we are using for our visual acuity measurements, at least those of us who are not in the visual acuity field. Um, it's based on distinguishing between two points or lines, and because a cycle has a, a bright part and a dark part, one um, arc minute of resolution is the same as 30 cycles of uh, resolution. But if you ever have gone stargazing, one of the stars that you've probably seen is Deneb. It's in the uh, constellation Cygnus, the Swan. Uh, it's very easily visible to the naked eye. It's the 19th brightest star in the sky, but it has an angular diameter on Earth of approximately 0 0.0024 arc seconds, which is 25,000 times smaller than what 2020 vision can show. And yet you can see that star. So the size of a luminous point is generally irrelevant. And luminous points is what you have on a TV. Uh, and contrast matters. So the more contrast that you have, your 
got a black sky with this uh, star, um, it allows you to see it even though it's extremely small. This is the distribution of rods and cones in the eye. The um, red line is the distribution of rods, which tend to be around the sides of the eye. And the green line is the distribution of cones. In the foveola, which is the central part of vision where we have the uh, fine color vision, there's actually no blue cones at all. So how do we see blue if that's where we're looking at color vision? Well, it's because our eyes are moving all the time. Uh, we have ballistic motion called saccadic motion. And this is what uh, gets measured if somebody's looking at a face, the eyes are actually doing all those various things. So combine that with the Lechner distance, and it's the basis of the resolution discussions for HDTV, um, UHD, 4K, 8K, and so on. NTSC had about 480 active lines. 2020 vision has roughly one arc minute of acuity. By the way, today we have a uh, vision that's better than uh, 2020. Um, so that's 60 arc minutes per degree, which means 8 degrees. If you work out the trigonometry, it turns out that a 25-inch TV back in the old days gave you as much resolution as you could possibly see. Uh, now, the Lechner distance, again, was that 9 feet, and that's critical for this measurement. Um, but what is the flat panel viewing distance? The Lechner distance was based on furniture and room sizes. Well, the flat panel is now closer to the wall than your TV set was. So we're probably watching at a longer distance, but is there any fixed viewing distance whatsoever? Here's somebody who's relaxed on the left and very excited on the right, and there's a, almost a meter of difference between those two states with the same um, furniture in the same room. Here's uh, viewing distance for an 8K display. The recommended viewing distance is where the feet are, and if you had a couch in that position, your knees would be up against the cabinet. Nevertheless, perception is learned. Um, they've done experiments with kittens where from birth they've deprived them of being able to see, let's say, vertical lines. They can only see horizontal lines, and then they put them on this sort of uh, trolley apparatus, and there's glass, that's what those black things are, uh, glass over a uh, hole, and the kittens who could not see the vertical lines won't step on that glass because it looks to them like there's a hole. But the kittens who can see the horizontal lines will step on the other glass because they know that there's lines there, so there's something standing there. Um, so perception changes, and perhaps Percival's zone of comfort will change when people start watching 3D TV, if we ever get to the point of 3D TV. This is um, a uh, chart in Yachting World magazine of how, how many crew get seasick, and the younger you are, the more seasick you get, because as you get older, you understand what um, ocean motion does, and therefore you don't get seasick. This is not people who've been crew for a long time. This is just people who happen to be older. And it's not just learn changes. Look at the right side for a moment. It's going to change. Um, that's what happens if you have a loud noise. Um, so it's going to go back and forth between the no loud noise and loud noise. With age, your high frequency hearing changes. It uh, gets worse. And if you look at the left chart now, that kind of shaded area is where conversational speech is. And so as you lose that high frequency information, you're losing the ability to pick up conversational speech. Uh, you may have noticed this on a TV show or a movie that you've gone to and you can't understand what people are saying as you get older. It's not just kittens and yacht crew. Um, this is the first um, showing of movies that people paid for, the Lumiere brothers, in 1895. And this guy reports that um, when this train came into the picture, a woman just got so excited that she stood up and she wouldn't sit down again until after the car had passed. And 
various people have reported this in different ways uh, that she got so um, scared of what she was seeing. Well, let me give you a, a rough idea of what she was seeing. That's it. The train is not heading towards the camera at all. There's people standing on the platform. It's black and white. You know, that's what she was seeing, but she was so excited. Um, well, there's not much information about the Lumiere screening, and it's just this one report of one woman, but Edison did something he called tone tests after uh, the Victor company had superseded him and uh, phonograph sales. Uh, he came up with a new disk-based phono system, and he needed to prove to people that his system was better than any other. And so he would do these tests, sometimes in a record store where people would be blindfolded and asked to tell whether they were hearing the phonograph or the singer. And sometimes it would be in some big thing like Carnegie Hall, and the lights would go out, and they'd be asked to um, tell if it was the phonograph or the singer, and they all reported, no one could tell the difference. Here's a report in the uh, Pittsburgh Post in 1919. Didn't seem difficult to determine in the dark when the singer sang and when she did not. Was pretty sure about it until the lights were turned on, and it was discovered that the singer was not on the stage at all, and it was the phonograph. And we today are going, what? They couldn't tell the difference between a 78 RPM phonograph recording and a live person? Well, no, they couldn't, because perception is learned. Just the very idea that there was playback at all at that time was super exciting. Plus, uh, one of the singers, Anna Case, who uh, was a soprano at the Metropolitan Opera, confessed in 1972 that she made herself sound like a phonograph recording of herself. <laughs> uh, just another quick thing on learned perception. This is something called the chromostereoscopic effect. Some of you might get a sensation that the letters here are in front of the blue background and uh, that this these blue are behind the blue background. Uh, it's because, again, our eyes lens is a fairly simple lens. It can't focus on different colors at the same time. Well, when the NTSC was convening, actually the first NTSC that came up with black and white TV, they were so concerned about color that maybe people would be fatigued by watching color TV that they had to get an ophthalmologist in to say, no, it's okay, you can have color TV. So now that second question, does HDR require more bits? So what is HDR? It's high dynamic range. Here is a sequence of three photographs. This is exposed sort of for the trees in the background, but you have not much idea of what's happening in the foreground. Now you have better idea of what's happening in the foreground. You can see some of those things. You can see the uh, car coming in, but you can't really see what's in the car. And now if we expose for the car, we can see the people inside the car, but we can't really see the trees at all. So is there a way of combining all this into one image and thereby we get high dynamic range? Now, if we can do high dynamic range, we get more benefits. Uh, we typically look at a color chart like the one on the left, but that's at a fixed luminance. And if you look at different luminances, as is happening on the right, there's different ranges of color that you can see. So if the TV set can get brighter, you can see colors that you couldn't possibly see on uh, standard dynamic range TV. And this was at the Technology Summit uh, for Cinema on, at NAB in 2014. This was some preliminary results from a laboratory in Switzerland. And it shows that as the brightness and theoretically contrast, because uh, they all had the same dark level, uh, goes up, you get a tremendous amount of improvement. So you get a full grade of improvement uh, going from uh, roughly 100 nits or 100 candelas per meter squared, which is what your uh, reference monitor used to be, uh, up to 400. And going from 400 to 4,000, you get uh, another full grade of improvement. I'm just pointing out, you can't really tell if it's the luminance or the contrast in this because both were changing at the same time. Uh, but it's the most bang for the bit. If you increase from HD to 4K, yes, it is visible. 
under certain conditions, but you can definitely see the difference. But it's about between a third of a grade and a half of a grade of improvement. That's what the left uh, chart is showing for going from HD to 4K. If you go up in frame rate, every doubling of the frame rate is a grade of improvement, and that's better than going from uh, HD to 4K, but it's still a doubling of the bit rate. And if you go from SDR to HDR, then you get a grade of improvement or more than a grade of improvement and very little additional bits, maybe zero. So let's start discussing that. Um, dynamic range for images is the range from the darkest to the lightest perceptible stuff. And your environment then becomes important because there's desired light and undesired light. In a cinema, you have fairly low desired light, but you also have very low undesired light. You watch movies in a very dark room. At home, you have medium desired light and undesired light. Handheld, you have medium desired light and a tremendous amount of undesired light. So here's home viewing, um, typical situation. There's the desired light and there's some of the undesired light. Here's a cinema. This is an actual photo shot in a cinema. Uh, they were showing the World Cup at the time. And notice that you can see the stairs and you can see the people in the cinema. Um, so the screen is a little overexposed. But look at the band on the side of the screen to the left of the image, and it's pretty bright. You can see that pretty well. Well, the projector is not putting out anything there. That's light that's being reflected from the audience back to the screen. So here's the HDR situation when you're watching something. Uh, the light is coming off the screen, but it's being reflected from the ceiling, the audience, the floor, the back wall, and it goes back to the screen. Now, at the International Broadcasting Convention in 2015, um, Pete Luday, who was then at um, Real D, he was the senior vice president, he said that the Real D scientists found that the greatest reflection in a movie theater auditorium is actually from the audience. And therefore, the best HDR results are when there's an empty cinema. Uh, but they went further. Uh, it's really a problem only when the screen is bright. And so the best HDR results are when the screen is black. <laughs> so take an empty cinema auditorium with a black screen, you could do fantastic HDR. Now, this is the uh, standard or the uh, criteria for HDR that the Ultra HD Premium people came up with, the UHD Alliance. And for uh, LED TVs, the black is supposed to be 0 0.0005 nits. And maybe the TV set will put that out, but then maybe you have to watch it like this. But this is an important thing. It's not about bit depth. Um, theoretically, HDR requires no more bit depth than SDR. And it doesn't matter how much the HDR is. So let's talk about digitization of an analog signal. We need to do two things. We need to sample it in time, and then we need to assign levels to the samples. That's called quantizing. So we have sampling and quantizing. Sampling is perfectly mathematically reversible. As long as you filter when you're sampling and you filter when you're reproducing, you can get exactly back to what you started with. Uh, and the filtering has to be such that your sampling rate is more than twice the highest frequency that you want. But quantization, and it doesn't matter how many bits you have, can never be perfect. It always has errors without exception. So if you look at this in the uh, sample number one, the red dot happens to fall on a quantum, but in sample number two, um, the, red, the signal is where the blue X is, and that's not where the quantum is. So it's going to be uh, quantized as quantum five, or maybe quantum six, depending on how far off it is. That's an error. That's not where it was. Well, we can have two types of errors. We can have an error that's correlated with the signal, or we can have an error that's random. 
the technical descriptions of those two errors are distortion and noise, and the oral and visual perception of those errors are edginess in the sound uh, or contouring in the video, that's for the distortion, or hiss in the sound and graininess in the video um, for uh, random or uncorrelated errors. So how do we convert correlation to randomness? We have to make sure that there is enough noise in the signal one half of the least significant bit in terms of power level or roughly one least significant bit peak to peak of noise. And if that noise is in there, you don't get quantization. And it doesn't matter how few bits you have. I mean, sorry, you don't get distortion. It doesn't matter how few bits you have. Um, an alternative to this noise is what Quantel came up with in the 1980s called dynamic rounding. So let me give you a demonstration about this. This is from the audio research group at the uh, University of Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, John Vanderkoy uh, has uh, given me permission to show this to you. And um, you're going to see, some, or you're going to listen to some music samples. So um, the upper left is what the original looks like. Now it's a kind of a, a snappy tune, so it's got music all the time. But if you look at the um, one below the upper left, the bottom left, you'll see that sometimes the signal goes away completely. Now if it wasn't a snappy tune, then you might have something if someone was talking where it would, uh, I, it, and, uh, and, uh, because you don't have enough quantization. There's only three bits. And then there's various versions with um, noise and dither, and I'm going to show you the one at the bottom right. This is still just three bits, and in this case, it's got one uh, LSB of noise or one half LSB of noise power-wise, and you'll see what it sounds like. So here's the original. Hey, mister, won't you play my song? I think it's a good one, but I can't be wrong. Okay, and now here it is, three bits quantized with no noise. Awful, right? Um, we don't like that. But now, let's listen to the same three bits. We're not increasing the bit rate at all. No quantization increase, but now we're adding noise. Hey, mister, won't you play my song? I think it's a good one, but I can be wrong. Doesn't sound as good as the original, because it's got some hiss in there, but the hiss is not so bad. Noise is not a terrible thing. And noise is a necessary thing when you have digital signals. So that was audio. Let's look at the same thing in video. The original image is on the left. Then we have eight bits with no dither, and there's a tremendous amount of contouring there. I think you can see that. Um, then there's eight bits with dither, and it looks quite good. And then there's just four bits with dither, and it looks better than the eight bits with no dither. It does not have contouring. Um, down at the bottom, I'm showing an extreme blow-up, and you can see there's certainly noise there, but noise does not bother us as much as distortion does. So people like to talk about digital systems being noise-free. That's terrible. We don't want things to be noise-free. Uh, now, processing is generally multiplicative. So let's say we want to fade this picture of the cat to black. Then we take the original signal, we multiply it by 1, that's the full cat, then by 0.9, by 0.8, and so on. Eventually, by 0, we end up with a black screen. Same thing if you're fading out audio. And multiplication generally increases digits. So if I take two two-digit numbers, 33 and 44, and I multiply them by each other, I end up with 1452, which has four digits. So I've gone from two digits to four digits. So what? Who cares? Uh, well, you do the same thing in binary. Take an 8-bit signal and multiply it by another 8-bit signal, and you end up with a 16-bit signal. So now let's go back to that noise. So 
let's say we have noise in the last bit. It's only one, one uh, bit of noise, least significant bit. So one noise possibility is that it's one zero 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 zero, and the other noise possibility is that it's one zero 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 one, and that works. That's the noise that we want to eliminate the distortion. But now let's multiply that by something. We're fading to black. We're um, fading out, and we end up with zero 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 one. And the noise has now moved to the second digit, but when we truncate that to 8 bits, we've lost the noise. If we round it to 8 bits, we've lost the noise. Doesn't matter how you go down to 8 bits unless you convolve. You can do convolution and you can move the noise into the uh, bits. But if you don't do the convolution, you've lost the noise, and if you've lost the noise, you've got the contouring back. So contouring is not caused by too few bits, it's caused by too little noise. And you can never have enough bits. By the way, this is not a, a new idea. This is from the SIMTI journal in 1989, uh, Quantel's dynamic rounding. They're showing the noise there on the right, and it worked fine for the Quantel products. Now, what are the quanta? Well, some digital quanta, uh, 8 bits, 0 to 255, 10 bits, 0 to 1023, 12 bits, 0 to 4095. And what are some luminances? We could have 100 nits, we could have 1,000 nits, we could have 10,000 nits. A nit, by the way, is a candela per meter squared. Um, now, it might seem like it makes sense to go from 8 bits for the 100 nit and 10 bits for the 1,000 nit and 12 bits for the 10,000 nit, uh, but you don't have to. You could use 12 bits for 100 nits. You want to have nice, fine uh, resolution there, or high signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, or you could use 10,000 nits in the 8 bits. All you get from more bits is more signal-to-noise ratio. You do not get elimination of contouring. You can never have enough bits because of that multiplication. So if you start with 12 bits and you do multiplication, you're up to 24 but you can't carry the 24 around. Or if you can carry the 24 around, you do another multiplication. Now you're up to 48 bits, and you can't carry that around. Or if you can carry the 48 around, you do another multiplication. So you can never have enough bits. You always have to have noise, and you have to know how to keep the noise in the signal. One more perceptual thing related to bits is Weber's law. Uh, Weber's law is that the perceived change is proportional to the signal strength. So here is human vision. It's not entirely linear, but there are some linear sections that um, two vertical lines there uh, is generally the, the range of what you're going to watch in a movie theater or a TV set. And that's pretty linear, and the slope of the uh, change is about um, one in that region. So let's say that the perceptible difference is 1%. It doesn't matter what it is, but let's say it's 1%. So if we assume an 8-bit system, then 1% at level 100 is going to be either level 99 or level 101. That's fine. That works perfectly for what the 8-bit system does. But 1% at level 200 is going to be 198 or 202, so we've wasted bits. We have more bits than we need. But 1% at level 10 is going to be quantum 9.9 .9 or 10.1, and we don't have such quanta. So we don't have enough bits. And if we go down to level 1, it's even worse. So we have a problem. Now, in traditional television, we got rid of that problem by uh, gamma compensation, and the CRT compensated in part for the gamma curve that we had in the camera. In today's displays, we have a digital processing curve and a higher internal bit rate. So Pete can tell you about some of the displays that are out there that have 16, 24-bit internal processing, whatever it is. Okay, since we're already at HDR, let's continue. But first, let's look at the difference between luminance and brightness. Words that end in ness are psychological. Happiness, goodness, cleanliness, 
coldness, painfulness. Um, things that don't end in ness can be physical quantities. So luminance is a physical quantity. You can measure it with a light meter. You can't measure brightness with a light meter. Brightness is what you think it is. If we look at the uh, two squares on the right, I think everyone in the room will agree, if you're not fooling around, that the one on the left looks darker than the one on the right. Correct? Um, that's your psychophysical sensation. But in fact, if I bring the two together, the squares are exactly the same brightness. So the luminances are the same. The brightnesses, when we look at it this way, are different. When we look at it this way, they're the same. Perception is not engineering. Perception is something that happens in the mind. Brightness is not the same as light level. Loudness, loudness is not the same as sound level. Sharpness is not the same as focus. And notice that these pathways, um, you're seeing other stimuli there, the gustatory center, the olfactory center, and they're near each other. So, in fact, you can see different things depending on what you're eating or smelling at the time. More on perception being in the brain, uh, the picture on the left is an actual picture. It's called a fundoscope picture. Fundoscope is what your ophthalmologist uh, uses to look at your retina, and that's what your retina looks like. And what you notice is that the film is in backwards because there's these blood vessels that are on the front side of your retina. So there's blood moving through those things, blood cells, and that's what you have to look through when you're seeing the world. But your brain is m removing that. Under most circumstances, it'll remove that. There are occasions you look at a bright blue sky or something, you'll see little things moving around at your heart rate. Uh, that's the blood coursing through your retina, but most of the time it gets rid of it. Also, that yellowish uh, area there, that's where the blood vessels and the optic nerve get into the eye, and you can't see anything there because there's a hole, but your brain eliminates that hole. So, HDR... Um, this is from something that Peter Senton, who was then at Grass Valley, uh, did in 2015. He says the HDR shader, who's on the left, doesn't have to do anything because the cameras can capture everything. Meanwhile, the SDR shader is constantly working. There's something to that. Um, but what you res end up with is not necessarily something that you like. So here is uh, some stuff that I've done on white and on black, and I don't think any of you can see anything on the black. If I reduce the contrast ratio, now you can see that there's stuff on the black too, except the black isn't black anymore, and the white isn't white anymore. So just reducing the contrast ratio is not good enough, as the producers of Game of Thrones discovered earlier this year when they did a show that had tremendous dynamic range, a lot of information in the blacks, and people at home didn't see it. Um, here is an image that was actually shown at NAB in 2008 at the Technology Summit for Cinema. This is the Grass Valley Sensium CMOS sensor, and there's a 10 million to 1 contrast ratio in there. I've blown up the filament of the light so you can see the actual coils on the filament as well as making out every shade of black on the chip chart. So, tremendous dynamic range, very impressive picture, but is it a pleasing picture? And I would say no. Um, fortunately, we have high-pass spatial filtering in our eyes. This is our contrast sensitivity function, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. But we are not terribly sensitive to contrast at high spatial frequencies, fine detail, or even at low spatial frequencies. And just as with the sound, as we get older, um, we lose more of the high spatial frequencies. So if we take that into consideration, Ed wanted me to talk briefly about this, but in 1975, uh, working with Tom Stockham, I built an HDR to SDR converter. I didn't know that's what it was supposed to be called, um, but it was keep preserving local contrast and getting rid of overall contrast, which is what's happening in this image. 
So we can actually take stuff that was shot in HDR and in real time convert it to SDR and preserve the local contrast. And maybe that's what we want to do. Uh, instead of having HDR certainly in a cinema or perhaps even at home. And we can go the other way too. This is stuff that Technicolor showed at the uh, HPA tech retreat last year and I found it very impressive going from SDR to HDR and again concentrating on the local contrast. But if we don't have that HDR TV then we don't have those special colors that we could have only if the TV was very bright. But we also don't have a blue and yellow expansion issue. Hues shift as colors or as uh, displays get brighter and they don't shift linearly. So yellow expands and blue expands and red and green shrink. Uh, it's a very strange effect but it is actually real. This is from a paper that I urge you all to read especially if you have any desire to do anything in HDR. It's called How Independent Are HDR, WCG, which is Wider Color Gamut, and HFR, Higher Frame Rate, in uh, Human Visual Perception and the Creative Process. And I'll just read this one thing that he says on the front page. Uh, we as engineers can easily think of resolution, colors, color space, luminance, and frame rate as independent technological features, yet the human vision system makes no such stark distinctions. Here's some more HDR surprises. We talk, uh, sorry, this HDR surprises. We talk about HDR as being just for uh, speculars. It's going to show little glints. Um, and yet, here is a uh, promotion that the Ultra HD Premium people are showing where we're looking at snow and white clouds and so on taking up much of the screen. Well, it turns out that as the overall brightness increases, what you consider to be bright actually decreases. Um, so it's harder for you to have something that appears bright, that's specular, when the overall screen gets brighter. We also have this issue of bleaching. This is a good thing in the eye. You go out in the middle of the day uh, or get that two million nits that Pete was talking about. Uh, you don't want it to make you blind. And so what your eye does to prevent you from going blind is chemical adaptation and it makes your receptors less sensitive. Um, but that actually starts at SDR at about 100 uh, nits and then continues. So uh, should you not drive immediately after watching HDR? Or what happens if you change channels from that uh, sort of white cloud snow scene to a film noir thing that's on. Uh, it's not a very simple thing. Okay, uh, this is the exercise portion of the presentation. And um, let's take the, there's a big pair of images on top. There's a slightly smaller pair of images below that. And then a smaller one in the middle. Let's take those in the middle and I need a volunteer in the front row and a volunteer in the back row. Uh, any volunteers? Okay, those two will be fine. So, Mark, uh, without saying anything yet, um, in that pair of images in the middle, do you see one that looks like an angry man and one that looks like a neutral woman? Yes. Okay, and in the back, do you also see one that looks like an angry man and one that looks like a neutral woman? in the, the middle one on the bottom row, the second row? Yeah, almost. Okay. Uh, Mark, which is the angry man? Left. Okay, and which is the angry man? Right. Okay. How come he says it's the one on the left and he says it's the one on the right? They're both looking at the exact same image. Uh, if you would like, you can get up and come closer, go farther to see what your fellow people are seeing. Uh, if you prefer to do this at home, the slides are already available. Um, what's going on? Well, it's that contrast sensitivity function that I was telling you about before. So here it is on a sine wave grading. Does everyone see a sort of curve on the top like that, like was on my graph? Okay, I see a bunch of people nodding. Um, there's none there. 
there is no curve. Your visual system is putting it in and different people in the room are going to see that curve at different points. So what's happening with angry man, neutral woman, they're composite images on both the left and right. So both the left and the right have an angry man and a neutral woman. The angry on the left is at about six cycles per degree and the angry on the right is at about two cycles per degree. So Mark is, was seeing the six cycles per degree one and uh, in the back he was seeing the two cycles per degree one um, and you will see that shift when you get home and you look at this on your screen as you walk away from it, even the big ones you will see reverse position. I did this at the SMPTE Technology Summit on Cinema once and they had 600 people there. They were walking back and forth and they could all see this. So that's introducing the uh, concept of contrast and contrast is very, very important because Equipment tends to have a modulation transfer function. Modulation in this case is going from white to black or black to white. Transfer is getting it from the input to the output. Function is what the uh, curve looks like, and this tends to be what the curve looks like. Whatever it is, whether it's a piece of cable, whether it's an amplifier, whether it's a video switcher, it tends to have a curve something like this. Lenses also have a curve something like this. And sharpness, this is a human sensation because it's got that ness on the end, is proportional to either the area or the square of the area under the curve. This is not something that changes, but there's two schools of thought on this. Uh, Ari and Zeiss say it's the area. Sony and RCA say it's the square of the area. One way or the other, it depends on what's under the curve. Um, so when early HD camcorders came out, when Sony introduced HD cam, they said, okay, we can't record full HD. So we're going to drop down from 1920 pixels across to 1440 pixels across. Uh, so we're going to lose a significant amount of resolution, everything to the right of the red dashed line. But we're losing very little sharpness because all we're losing is the little bit under the toe of the curve. And that's how HD cam worked. Panasonic said, oh, this is great. We'll do the same thing in DVC Pro, uh, DVC Pro HD. We'll go to 1280, even less than the 1440. So if we go to HDR, we affect the sharpness more by raising the curve a little bit. And if we go to true HDR, where we're actually increasing the brightness of everything, we have a tremendous amount more area under the curve and therefore a tremendous amount more sharpness. So let me show you what this looks like in the real world with some old Canon cameras. Uh, that's an EOS 10D on the left and an EOS 20D on the right. The difference in resolution between the two sensors is only 14% linearly. Uh, that's the actual uh, MTF curve of those two cameras. And now let's look at something. This is intentionally something you can't read. Don't try to read it. Um, but I think you can see that the one on the right looks like it's sharper than the one on the left. That's just a 14% difference. Sound. If you lose sound, that's the end of the show. You put up the slide, that's all you can do. You lose picture, you keep the show going. Picture comes back, you have it. Um, but there are some interactions between sound and pictures. So looking down on a stage, uh, as picture on the left shows, we have three cameras and we have two people, two performers performers on the stage, and that little white dot at the edge of the stage is a microphone. So first we have some visual perspective differences. We have that near camera, which is the red rectangle, and that's what it's showing, that there's somebody that's close to the camera and there's somebody that's far from the camera, and there's significant difference between those two. The far camera is showing the image below that. Yeah, there's two people, they're a little bit different, but they're basically the same because the perspective is different. The camera on the left, the green one, is basically showing one person because one person is blocking the other person. And the camera on the right is showing two people separated by a great deal. 
Uh, but now let's take that person that's far away that we see in that top middle image and let's just do that one person and let's use that microphone at the lip of the stage. If we have a shot like this, distance sound is okay because we're accustomed to that. We know that sound travels much more slowly than light. We can go to a political rally and somebody is shouting up at the stage and we get the sound a second later or something like that, that's okay because we know that we're far away. But when we go to a close-up, now suddenly it's no good. And I've experienced this on some shows that I've done where we haven't changed anything and we get reports from people in the field saying it's out of lip sync. Well, because the director went from a wide shot to a tight shot with the sound being picked up at a distance. Here is a movie that's out now, I think, still, uh, Like a Boss. And I don't think I have to give you a spoiler alert because this is the very first thing in the movie. The movie opens and uh, Rose Byrne's character is talking on a cell phone um, to Tiffany Haddish's character. They have a discussion and it turns out that they're actually right next door to each other. They're on the same floor of the same building. Um, but the phone call doesn't sound perfect. Now, your phone, your cell phone, does sound pretty perfect. And it doesn't matter. You could be taking a call from China and it's going to sound pretty perfect. But that's not a cue to you that somebody is listening on the phone. So when you have a telephone call in a movie, the bandwidth of the call is restricted to what old dial phones used to be able to deliver so that you know it's a telephone call. We have other tropes like that. Uh, binoculars always have this kind of image, even though when you really use binoculars, you never see a figure eight like that. Dream sequence, we have uh, foggy, low contrast, maybe wavy pictures or something like that. And 24 frames per second is another less is more, perhaps. So reality is not the same as creative intent. Um, here's Sergei Eisenstein, the great Russian film director, and he says, it's my desire to intone, intone the hymn, hymn of the male, the strong, the virile, active, vertical composition, as Pete showed you earlier. Uh, here are two great French film directors, and they're both saying, um, cinema is black and white, why would you want to add color? And then there's this guy, uh, Michel Hasnavikis, uh, you may not be familiar with him, but he said, you know, sound, I met a lot of directors and most of them have a fantasy to make a silent movie because that's the purest way to tell a story. Well, who's he? He's the guy who directed The Artist, which won Best Picture of 2011, uh, won Best Director of 2011. It was black and white, it was silent, and it grossed more than $133 million. Not a lot in this age of superhero movies, but hey, more than made up its costs. In the 1970s, I participated in some focus groups where we provided stereo sound, which people had not heard with television before. And one of the common um, comments that we had was, wow, the picture got bigger. And all we did was provide stereo sound. The chart that I'm showing here is uh, from a company, uh, Penguin Engineering, and they did some tests of one-dimensional sound versus two-dimensional, uh, one-dimensional versus three-dimensional, and two-dimensional versus three-dimensional. And the one-dimensional versus two-dimensional, 83% um, of the people, 84% of the people said, oh yes, you know, this sounds uh, much more immersive. Uh, when they went from one-dimensional to three-dimensional, even more people, 88%. But, you know, they've only added about 5% by going to three-dimensional. And when they went from two-dimensional to three-dimensional, it was only 60% of the people who said, this is better. So not all improvements are equal. The first thing that we do, going from SD to HD, great improvement. Going from HD to 4K, less improvement. Going from 4K to 8K, Still less improvement. So here's somebody's face, and we think that from looking at this face, we ought to have that kind of aspect ratio, the wide that Pete was talking about, not the high. 
Uh, but here's the facial architecture of that face. And there's a brow ridge, there's cheeks, there's a nose, and all of those combine to give us this kind of visual field. And uh, you can see it's kind of a rectangular visual field if you include the things that only the left eye can see and only the right eye can see. But if you count only the things that both eyes can see, which is necessary for stereo, it's kind of a not terribly wide visual field, almost circular. So why do we have wide aspect ratio instead of high aspect ratio? It's because of gravity, because people are on the ground and they walk and they move and they ride bicycles. So they enter and leave frames. The action tends to happen horizontally. So a little bit about field of view. This is a paper that NHK did, and they show that the sense of realness, uh, sorry, the sense of being there increases with increasing field of view, but the sense of realness decreases with increasing field of view. Well, it makes sense if you have an 8K or whatever the display happens to be, you have fewer pixels as the field of view increases. So that's why the realness goes down. And there's also this funny being there peak that they showed. It seems to peak at around 80 uh, degrees. So maybe that requires a little bit more study. Um, can there be too much resolution? Uh, pixel pitch is the distance between the centers of picture elements. And pixels are not little squares. They are theoretical places where picture information is. So this is an interesting pattern of squares. And if I simply blur that, you start to see that this is actually a picture of somebody. Uh, you can do that by squinting your eyes also. So here's an engineering problem that SMPTE had in the 1980s. Looked like we were going to get into electronic production. They had a working group that was headed by Kearns Powers of RCA. And this was the problem. We may be shooting 1.33 to 1 for television. We may be shooting 2.35 to 1 for cinema. How can we do that best? And well, engineering problem, uh, the least waste of space on the image sensor is if we do something like this, which is 1.77 to 1, tiny bit less than 16 to 9. 16 to 9 is roughly 1.78 to 1. Um, so that's where the 16 to 9 aspect ratio uh, came from in terms of promotion for cameras. There was a, a different origin for TV sets. And then we have this operational shortcut. Uh, I did not come up with the word fluff. This is something that was used in SMPTE papers. You have to have your uh, good stuff in the 4 to 3 range and then fluff on the outside. And then here are some images provided uh, by Frontline. Um, shoot and protect is what's on the left. Looks fine in 4 to 3. Looks like a lot of wasted space in 16 to 9. Uh, on the other hand, if we have the one on 16 to 9 on the right that looks fine, and we cut that to 4 to 3, then we have a problem. But action, again, happens in gravity. And dramatic and comedic timing tends to be when something or someone enters or leaves a frame. So in this case, someone's going to enter the 16 to 9 frame a lot earlier than the person is going to enter the 4 to 3 frame. Well, the cinematographers knew that all the time. So SMPTE codified this as uh, SMPTE 195. Um, and they said, just keep the sides common. Change the height. Gravity is going to be the same. Everything is going to enter and leave the frame at the same time. Comedic timing is going to work. Dramatic timing is going to work. And to his credit, Kearns Powers, who headed the working group on electronic production, said, had the working group been aware in 1984 of the full frame soft mat protection scheme, it's by no means obvious that 16 by 9 would have amassed the advantages over 4 to 3 that persuaded the working group to make that choice. Had they but known. Well, it was published in the Simpty <laughs> Journal in 1976. Traditional cinema has this frame rate of 24 frames per second. And that was so significant that it was awarded an Emmy when electronic uh, production was able to use 24 frames per second. 
Well, here's the very first standard that SIMPI came up with. SIMPI was before SIMPTI. The T was added in 1950. Uh, and it was film speed. And there's the standard. A film movement of 60 feet per minute through the motion picture mechanism shall be considered a standard speed. Well, 60 feet per minute for four perforation 35 millimeter is 16 frames per second. And this is an interesting paper published in the uh, transactions of the society in 1926 by this guy Richard Rowland who you may not be familiar with but he headed just about every Hollywood studio that existed uh, was a good engineer as well and he says so oh, I see that you're now going to come up with a different standard for projection you're gonna say projection should be at 80 and the taking speed should stay at 60 so when we see those movies with people moving very fast, the old silent movies, that's how people watch them in those days. They were projected faster than they were shot. Uh, but he says, hey, you know, if you're doing a uh, comedy, then maybe you want it to be uh, 95 feet per minute. And if you're doing a drama, then maybe you want it to be 80 or 85 feet per minute. And he says, unless all directors are standardized and work mechanically, then how could you possibly have a standard frame rate? So why 24 frames per second? Well, some people say, oh, it's the minimum required to depict motion. Well, here's some motion. This is one frame per second, and you know maybe that's a little too slow, but we'll get up to five in a moment. Okay, there's five frames per second. I can see motion pretty easily. And that's just five, and it's going to go to 15 in a moment. No question, 15 is motion. So you don't need 24 to depict motion. And that was unfiltered. If we filtered that temporally, then even the one frame might have looked pretty good. So is it the minimum required to eliminate flicker? Well, here's traditional motion, moving image display illumination. The projector has a rotating shutter. It shows a frame, it goes black, shows the same frame a second time, then it pulls down another frame. TV doing something similar in the old days, uh, showing a field, then showing another field, the two fields combined to make one frame. But current moving image display il illumination, LCD, the image stays until it's changed, and you can have a backlight that um, changes at high frequencies. DLP has very high frequency modulation, uh, LED or OLED has adjustable frequency, so flicker doesn't have to be tied to image presentation rate anymore. HDR, by the way, makes flicker more visible. Uh, what you want is what's inside that red oval, and what you see that's dark is aliases that you can see that you don't want to have, and then there's aliases that kind of fade away, they're very light, but if you increase the dynamic range, those fading away aliases come back and so flicker becomes more obvious. So this is from that same uh, Sean McCarthy paper, uh, and it shows that as uh, brightness increases, flicker becomes more visible, that's on the left, or at the same brightness, as field of view increases, flicker becomes more visible. Now I've added um, red, green uh, lines here, and also a little box, the red line is roughly where 24 frames per second is. The green line is roughly where television is. And you can see the television is relatively okay, the 60 frames per second. Uh, but 24 needs to be pretty dark. So the SIMPTI standard for 48, or the recommended practice for 48 nits for a cinema screen, that's not a minimum. That's a maximum. We want movie screens to be dark. Um, but I spoke to a, a vision scientist and he calculated these things and he said, hmm, I don't know about those numbers you got there because uh, it looks to me like you need 70 hertz at even just 125 nits. But he said this was based on a, a square wave grading and uh, content will vary and will determine how much flicker you see. So here's Super Bowl 2020, an article about it, the madness and magic behind the game's first 4K HDR broadcast. Was it 4K? Pete. Pete says, no, it was not 4K. It was actually shot in HD and then upconverted to 4K, and the article gives many reasons why they did that. 
Um, but here's a quote from the article. It turns out that 1080p at 60 frames per second delivers really smooth motion, while 4K at 60 frames per second does not. With 4K at 60 frames per second, you can definitely see some motion artifacting, says this guy. Uh, and as you can imagine, blurriness, smearing, and pixelation in fast-moving sports is a no-go. Now, why is that? Well, you're going to have a certain speed that things are crossing the screen, whether because the things are moving, like a quarterback, or whether the camera is moving. And if you have a certain number of pixels per time that works for you, if you go to half-size pixels, then you have two pixels per time for that same speed. So here's a chart in the old uh, uh, American Cinematographer Manual. It says that 35 millimeter camera recommended panning speeds in degrees per second. Um, how about pixels per second? Here's unaliased pixels per second, and the uh, more resolution you have, the faster you need the frame rate to be. So why 24 again? Well, some people say it's the minimum required for audio fidelity. Um, but the sound quality started with the Vitaphone. It was based only on a disc. This, by the way, was the first disc to be 33 and a third uh, RPM. Um, so the sound quality had nothing to do with the film uh, speed. The film speed could be anything. You could change the gearing. So why 24 frames per second? A near arbitrary decision based on a need for a constant playback speed, existing hand-cranked projection practices. Stanley Watkins of Western Electric met with Sam Warner and Walter Rich in a projection booth with Warner Brothers chief projectionist Jack Keckley, and they asked him how fast are films projected. And he said, in first-run houses, anything from 80 to 90 feet per minute, and then the small ones, anything from 100 feet per minute on up, depending on how many shows you want to squeeze in. Uh, so Watkins thinks for a second, says, okay, let's make it 90. And that's where 24 frames per second came from. No perceptual reason whatsoever. Nevertheless, this is something called the wagon wheel effect. And why is it called the wagon wheel effect? Because of movies that have wagon wheels in them. And as the disk starts spinning faster and faster, you'll start seeing some strange motion aliases. And things will start going backwards and so on. Um, but did anyone ever complain about that? People noticed it, yeah, but did anyone say, no, I'm not going to go see that John Wayne movie because the wagon wheels go backwards. <laughs> Here's motion smoothing versus dynamic resolution. I mentioned that temporal filtering on the left and the right, you can see uh, that the ties and the tracks are equally sharp. But the locomotive is blurry on the left. That's not necessarily a bad thing if you want to depict smooth motion. And it's very sharp on the right. That's not necessarily a bad thing if you want to depict high dynamic resolution. But you can't do both at the same time. The higher the frame rate, the better you get. Just like quantization noise, there's always going to be a problem. Here's a pretty famous image that shows what temporal filtering is like. This is uh, Boulevard du Temple in Paris, and it looks like a neutron bomb has gone off. There's nothing there. It's actually a very busy street, but it was a slow exposure. There's a person. This is considered the first image of a person, um, and there he is getting his shoes shined. You can kind of see the person getting his shoe shine. You can't really see the shoe shining person because that one is moving. But here's a window. It's got fine resolution. So it's not a question of resolution, the lens, or anything like that. So motion prediction, a ball player uh, predicts where a ball is going to go so that he can catch it. And if we do motion imaging, we can do the same thing. The ball is at this uh, green dot, that green dot, and so on. But if we do that image repetition, motion prediction, we have this strange situation. The motion does not look as predictable as it did. And sometimes you see double images when you're looking at stuff. And yet, is that a bad thing? Well, last year, Tom Cruise said, no, it's not a bad thing. We want this to be uh, the way it is. And immediately, an engineer I know said, you will take my motion compensation away from my cold, dead hands. Well, this year, the UHD Alliance says, ah, we have filmmaker mode. Filmmaker mode is turning off motion compensation. And this makes everyone happy. 
And times can change too. Here's a director who was interviewed an American cinematographer and he concluded that 60 frames per second is too vivid and lifelike for a traditional fiction film, becomes invasive. For conventional movies, it's best to stay with 24 frames per second. And who was that? That was Douglas Trumbull, who is now promoting high frame rate. And it's fine. He can change his mind. Also, he came up with new technology to improve stuff. Um, here is a high frame rate movie that came out this year, uh, Gemini Man. 120 frames per second. Um, now, did it have a film look? I can't answer that. I will note that the studios are paying Kodak to continue manufacturing film. They uh, want it to be available. But what is the film look? Is it based on image repetition, black between images, gate weave, 24 frames per second, grain, halation, lighting, color and transfer characteristics? And does it matter because most people are not watching movies projected on film anymore? Um, the cinematographer of Knives Out wants to end the debate. He has four characteristics that he says contribute to a film look. He says there was never the film look. A movie has a look and you can make that look whatever you want. So let's get into color. Um, this is a hypothetical ideal of three visible primaries. This is as good as you can get. This is better than uh, BT 2020. Uh, and yet, if you look on the left side, there's all those kind of turquoise colors that cannot be reproduced with those three primaries. So what do we do? We can have more than three primaries. This is one company that says, oh, we could have four or five different primaries. Here's incorrect color coding, decoding. And you can see at the bottom that there's a slight difference between those images. But as for which is the way it's supposed to look, I can't really tell you. But if you look at the color bars to the left of the vector scope, you can see that there's a difference between the two because you can see the hue shade. So here is perception of just one bit out of 24. I have pure yellow on the left. I have pure yellow with one bit of blue on the right, and I've combined them in the middle, and I think that most of you can see an O in the middle there. We are extremely sensitive to local color shift. We are not very sensitive to large area color shift. So here's an image with almost all of the red removed from it. Uh, can anyone tell me what color the top that the woman in the middle is wearing? Yellow. yellow, I hear from a lot of people, okay. And you are correct, she's wearing a yellow top. But this is what you just saw if I just showed you the top and not anything else. So we do an awful lot of color correction in our visual system. And how we see color is very strange. This is an all black and white disc called a Benham disc. And now it's rotating and when it achieves a certain speed, some of you we'll probably see some colors there. Anyone seeing any colors yet? Red, purple. Yeah, some people are seeing some colors. So back in the old days when color TV sets were expensive, this guy came up with an actual system for shooting television or film the way the Benham disc works. So you would have this filter wheel that's shown on the right, half opaque and with uh, yellow, magenta, and cyan regions that would turn red, green, and blue black. And then they actually did a commercial for a soft drink called Squirt, and people saw um, colors. But this was, you know, crazy. Uh, it was 1968 that this appeared in the Simpty Journal. Uh, it appeared in Popular Science in 1969. Uh, by then, color TV prices were starting to come down. People could afford them. So technology changes. So some inequality takeaways. Contouring is not caused by too few bits. Engineering is not perception. Reality is not the same as creative intent. More is not necessarily better. Parameters are not independent. Technology is not a constant. Color TVs get cheaper. Perception is not a constant. Um, the content, the environment, and the duration affect things. Learning affects things, and aging affects things. 
and there are two people arguing over what they are seeing, and they're seeing the exact same thing. Thank you. I'll be happy to entertain questions. Pete can also. And again, a PDF of all these slides is already available at bit.ly slash sny hyphen 2 hyphen 20. And uh, with the sound, this will be posted in a few days on shubincafe.com. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yep. <laughs>